Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the podcast, and Hunter's joining me today. Hunter, thanks for being here. Autumn, it's great to be here. And we were just discussing before we started recording that we don't quite remember our politics part two <laughs> conversation, because even though in the order of release, these come one week after the other, we actually have, there's a little bit of a gap between when we recorded them and in between that gap, Easter happened. You got mugged by the Easter bunny. So you don't, you don't even <laughs> uh, feel like yourself today. <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> although, although you're more yourself than you were a few days ago. So that's, so that's. That's good, but Autumn got run over by the Easter Bunny, and yeah. so uh, who, who gave me a virus? Apparently, <laughs> who gave you a virus? <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, this fits with whatever we discussed in part two. That's right. <laughs> we have recorded politics part one, which was the purpose of politics, and politics part two, the purpose of government, and we said some great things. In I listened part to part two. one today, and it, it, it was uh, I was pleased. I was still happy with it. <laughs> good. Well. Well, we're going to pick up uh, as if we remember what we discussed in part two <laughs> today. Uh, and my voice is still a little rough because, as you mentioned, in the intervening weeks between when we last recorded and when we're recording today, many things happened. We had a big Palm Sunday event. We celebrated Holy Week with our church family. My kids had spring break and I was very sick for many, many days. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, your voice is a little... Uh, week, but your spring fashion game is on point, and, <laughs> and it feels like spring today. That's right, and 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 your wardrobe today is is a reason why we should start YouTubing these uh, these <laughs> podcasts because Autumn has a light gray sweater that says midwinter, and she has pink pants that say spring, and when you put it all together, it says we are right in the transition between winter and spring and it's it's perfect it's on point and it's perfect well thanks hunter on the record i'm still not in favor of youtubing these oh, okay. conversations okay. So. i know you don't like my wardrobe commentary either <laughs> most people don't appreciate my wardrobe commentary so uh, our listeners I'm have said to, i'm trying to rate it in our listeners have said that they they think it's it's funny okay so yeah <laughs> If anyone out there uh, has an opposing thought, if you dislike the wardrobe commentary, then you can give me that <laughs> feedback too. <laughs> well, today well, we. Well, I'm wearing some dead British man's shoes, so you should know that. <laughs> I, I found a site that sells used British shoes, and I, I bought some last year. They're cheap, and uh, they look fantastic. And I'm like, this is probably a dead guy's shoes. And so that's my contribution to the wardrobe discussion today. <laughs> All right. Well, um, moving into our conversation for today, as part three of our politics discussions, we are going to talk about some trends in American politics. Uh, based on what you can recall of weeks one and two, Hunter, how would you set up today's conversation? <laughs> Give us a jumping in point. These are macro trends in American culture and life that affect our political environment. And if our listeners remember, we define politics not just as like governmental politics or electoral politics. It's not just the stuff that happens around elections and between Republicans and Democrats, but it's politics macro defined is how do a group of people live together and work together for the common good and for flourishing. It, it goes all the way back to the beginning of creation when God made a man and a woman and there was politics. And so Politics at a macro level is how does a society or a country, in our case, like America, how do we live together in this common political project called America? And what we thought it would be helpful to do is to just describe a few trends that are happening at a very high level in American life. These do affect the more narrow definitions of politics. They affect elections. They affect the House of Representatives and the Senate and the president, and they affect your local politics as well. So they, they affect all of the specific manifestations of what we commonly call politics. But these are big trends and big themes, and, and we think it's helpful as Christians to be aware of these big trends and themes. And you're going to 
solve them for us today and tell us what the Christian answer is for all of these themes. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, I didn't pick up on that in our prep uh, before the podcast that I I was supposed to come up with some uh, solutions. So I didn't do that. Uh, Well, we'll put you on the spot after we discuss them. (laughs) Before we discuss the three trends that we identified, there's a theme that we also wanted to mention that holds all three of these trends together. So what is that theme? I think the big theme is that America right now feels unstable and it feels less stable than it has at different times in our nation's history. Now there's been several moments in our nation's history when the political project that is the United States of America has not felt very stable right after the civil war leading up to, and right after the civil war is a great example of that. There have been other seasons when America feels like a very stable, sustainable political project. Uh, the the season after World War II would be an example of a very stable era in American politics that really lasted from the end of World War II into the 60s. And then the 60s felt like a very unstable time. And then the, the 80s and 90s felt pretty stable, especially post-Cold War. Very stable. We're in an unstable season. And And I think it's good to name some of the reasons why American politics feels so volatile and unstable right now. So that might be the macro theme that we'll put a few bullet points under three. I think you mentioned three (laughs) Three. bullet points we're going to put under that. (laughs) Yes, I did. I did say that we were going to discuss three. So the first of those three is that all politics is national. What what do we mean by that? (laughs) I think it's important to recognize how much the rise of mass media has shaped the way we think about political issues. There used to be this saying that all politics is local, and that was a way that politicians, especially those who were campaigning or running for office, they they reminded themselves that you've got to speak to the local people and you've got to connect with the local issues in you know, if you're a, if you're running for Congress, for example, you've got to connect with the issues in your district. And so all politics is local. And then all that kind of rolls up and America is the amalgamation of all of these local politics. And that, that is still true at a level. And, and yet there's a flip side today that really has become more and more the case as mass communication has grown and multiplied. And that is that w- what we might call national issues or big issues, they tend to seep down now into local politics. So a couple of examples people could think about. Think about the issues of race and abortion. Those are, those are two recurring political issues in American life. And more and more in, in the last decade or so, we have seen how the debate that's happening at a national level, or really it's the debate that's happening at on mass media. So it's happening on Twitter. It's happening on social other forms of social media. It's happening on the cable news networks. It's happening in the major national newspapers like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. The, these issues that are kind of being discussed through all these means of mass media now get down into every local sphere we we face. And so every every local expression of politics is having a debate about race or is having a debate about abortion at the state level, at the local level. And and so more and more people are, are noticing how mass media is eliminating some of the local peculiarities. And in some way, we're all having the same debate, no matter where in America you live. Hmm. I love that riff on words that you used, Hunter, where you said there used to be this saying that was pretty common that says all politics are local. And we're saying the trend now is all politics are national. And so what we read or see in mass media often then gets imported into our perspectives or assumptions of our local political entities or perhaps our local school or our local community organizations Do you see that happening? I do. And I think the reason it's important to be aware of it is that it, in some ways that is destabilizing because it introduces all of those debates into just our very local relationships where they may not have been introduced to those relationships in the past. To give a practical example, if I just think about my neighborhood, the people who live right around me, 
there there's a lot of different worldview represented in my neighborhood and and we we have some very different convictions about most things <laughs> and and yet we all live together as neighbors and 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 we shovel each other's sidewalks in the snow and we check each other's mail and pick up either, each other's packages and we have cocktails at Christmas and holiday cookouts in the summer and 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 we have interesting conversations. We have a a very stable political life um, in in my little neighborhood, even though core convictions are are different. I'm I am one hundred percent confident that 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 my next door neighbors are don't quite know what to do with me being the pastor of a of a of an evangelical church they they will when they introduce me to their friends they'll say he's over there praying for us while we're over here sinning and that's that's what they say and I'm like well that's kind of accurate I mean I wouldn't put it in those terms but like because I'm over here sinning too but I am praying for you and so we 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 joke but the if we if we now think we've got to solve all these big issues in our local neighborhood, it's going to be very destabilizing to these relationships that otherwise we figured out how to get along and, and live together and cooperate to, to, to have our lives. Mm-hmm. So that's that's one um, thing to think about is just to be aware of how importing national issues or, or broad issues into just your normal relationships can be destabilizing. Mm-hmm. Um, another example I've noticed is I see this all the time, and I face this temptation as a pastor, is to speak to issues that are being debated at a at a national level, primarily because I'm tuned into the debates that are happening online, and and then to think or to that those are really big issues in my church that I need to speak to when when I have to step back sometimes and go that's not really a problem in my church, and I need to be careful that I don't make it a problem in my church by by thinking I've got to hash out some angst I feel because I've been reading too much Twitter, you know, on, on the people in, in, in my church. And, and so I think we just need to be careful of how being so tuned into mass media and so tuned into debates that are happening at a macro level can be really destabilizing to otherwise healthy, normal relationships at a local or personal level. Mm, That's such good insight. I think, too, that uh, because of the influence of media and the way in which certain media outlets now tend more toward a particular political perspective or ideology, they not only encourage uh, the new, they not only portray perhaps national news in that way, uh, in a, a way that is skewed towards their ideological perspective, but they also sometimes and sometimes subtly assign a moral value to it and, and uh, may encourage a perspective of someone who takes a, a different understanding of an issue. And that can influence us too. I think when we import not only these national debates, mm. but then the perspective and moral value attached to them, whether or not we're doing so <laughs> intentionally uh, into our local relationships, but that can be damaging as well. I, I think you're making a great point. And many are noticing how we're sorting ourselves, even like where we live and who we're friends with, we're sorting ourselves based on these big national political issues. Uh, sociologists will call it the great sort. And Americans are choosing to live in places that just re- and around people that reflect their their beliefs. And I want to push back on that a little bit and say for our folks, maybe that's not a great thing. Maybe we need to actually have normal relationships with people who have very fundamental underlying differences than us. Maybe that's just... Maybe that's good for our testimony as Christians. Maybe that's good for gospel ministry. Maybe that's just good for political stability. By way of example, my next-door neighbors are a married gay couple. I know that we have different convictions about same-sex marriage. They can—I've written some things on this. They, they can see what I've put out in public. We very rarely have debates about, <laughs> about, about this issue, even though we know we, we have different opinion. We, they introduce me to their friends. I introduce them to to my friends. We still have cocktails together at Christmas, and and it we 
we just have a good relationship as as neighbors, and that is totally possible when we don't feel like we have to hash these debates out uh, to in 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 the course of our of our relationship. And I and I feel I, I feel no compulsion that I have to like argue this um, w- with them. I'm glad to discuss, but I don't feel like man, I've got to argue this, and I don't feel like I I can't be friends with and be around people who have different convictions than I do. But there is a lot of pressure now to just sort ourselves out and to go, man, I just can't, I just can't, you know, be friends with people or live among people who think differently than I, than I do. This leads us well, I think, into the second trend that we identified, which is that not only do we have a two-party system that in some ways, as you've said, has become more distant from each other, but within both parties now, a lot of ideological tension exists. Yeah, trend number two, ideological tension exists within both parties. And what, what do you em- envision when, when, when you wrote point two here about this ideological tension inside the parties, not just between them? Mm-hmm. I think there are examples, readily available examples within both parties. The one that comes to mind first is the way the Republican Party has been unsettled by the leadership of Donald Trump and the type of leader he he is. And that has beget all kinds of resorting based on attempts to gain political prestige and power within the parties. And some of that might be convictional, but much of it seems to be um, motivated by an attempt to gain a certain position within mm. the party. So there's been jockeying amongst other politicians because of the style of leader that Donald Trump is um, to to move them into a particular perspective that they wouldn't have adhered to before. Mm. So that's one of the tension points within the Republican Party right now is whether or not some of the politicians who have this kind of public stage will take a principled stance and be able to explain their political positions, or whether they will give voice to a political position that resonates with something they know will get the support of Donald Trump. This is maybe a little bit obscured by the fact that we have two major political parties in the U.S., but both of those parties have always been a coalition of people with different interests and positions. And, And so this is not just a recent phenomenon. There's like the Republican Party has always been a coalition of several different kinds of constituencies. And the Democratic Party has always been a coalition of several different kinds of constituencies. And so there's always jockeying within the parties among those constituencies. That's That's been true as long as there's been two parties. What we're seeing now, though, is those constituencies inside the parties are having more and more difficulty working together or they're less and less comfortable with each other. You were just talking about the Republican Party. Another example I've heard is one of the Republican Party's constituencies has always been what we might call classical conservatives. Mm-hmm. They are they are committed to a conservative tradition that is that emphasizes preserving the wisdom of previous generations, preserving the cultural wisdom that's built up in Western culture over time, and governing and leading out of that conservative wisdom and and then the conservative that that conservative philosophy also tends to not be averse to change but but they see value in incremental versus for, as opposed to what you would call revolutionary change and I, I read a, a fascinating book last year that I put on my best books list called Conservatism, a Rediscovery by a Jewish <laughs> scholar, Yoram Hazoni, and he's arguing for this Western British American conservative tradition. He's given a history of it. And it was very educational and enlightening to me. Many of those cl- of those that's not been the only constituency within the Republican Party. So even though we think of the Republicans as conservative, this philosophical, classical conservatism has 
not been the only constituency within the Republican Party. Another constituency within the Republican Party has been libertarians who mm-hmm. who are more of a live and let live. You know, you do you, we do me, freedom, and, you know, we just, we get along. They're, they're for small government. That's been a more libertarian tendency. So there's, that's just to name two of these constituencies. But the arrival of, of Trump and really the growth of, of his constituency has been very unsettling to some of those other Republican constituencies. Mm-hmm. And they don't quite, they don't know exactly what to do. <laughs> and, and, and should we accommodate to this? Do we have to go along with this? Do we go against it? So you see that tension um, within the Republican Party. You there- could see that match matchup between Trump, who is not a classically conservative Republican in the way that you're describing it, and Mike Pence, his vice president, who would be of that model, a classically conservative Republican. Mike Pence would be a classically conservative Republican, and he's also an evangelical Christian. So he has both of those dimensions, which have been constituencies of the Republican Party. And and you could see him trying to figure out how to adjust to Trump. The working class, more of the working class voters who Trump appeals a lot to, that's not only who he appeals to, but he a lot appeals to, some those have been a swing constituency in the history of American politics. They, for a long time, identified with the Democratic Party. My grandfather would have been one of those. Mm-hmm. He was like, the Democrats gave my daddy a job. When I told my grandfather that I had this teenage rebellion where I became a Republican and I and I campaigned for the first George Bush, and I made my granddad so mad because my granddad was like, my granddaddy, the, the Democrats gave him a job mm-hmm. in, in working class, you know, and he, he remembered that. And and so he was so loyal to the Democratic Party because of that. And and then Ronald Reagan won a lot of those voters to, to him. They were they were sometimes they were sometimes called Reagan Democrats. Uh, Bill Clinton appealed to a lot of those more on the Democratic side. So th- this has always been a swing constituency. And now Donald Trump appeals largely to that. And it's unsettling to to the constituencies within both parties. But we're talking about the Republican Party in this case. If we go to the other side, the Democratic Party, there's a lot of tension in the Democratic Party, too. The rise of this more aggressively secular progressivism, it's often labeled woke, but it has this, it, it, it's built around these identity politics, it's built around, it, it shares some philosophical affinities with kind of Marxist analysis of power dynamics, that you that you see on the on the on the particularly on the political left, and th- it's very represented in in universities. It, it's it's highly represented in academia, and it's become more and more represented in in the the big cities, the big cities of the, of the U.S., especially the coastal cities. Well, this this progressivism, this branch of progressivism, is is pretty unsettling to. The, the Democratic Party, because there are many of the Democratic Party who have not prescribed to that. They've and, and they wouldn't probably be as naturally comfortable with that. Joe Biden is a great example of that. Joe Biden as a senator was was is really nothing like Joe Biden as a president. Joe, Joe Biden as a senator, if you just take one example, would say things like on the issue of abortion, I'm personally opposed to it out of my Catholic convictions, or I don't personally agree with it, but I, but I think people should have the right to, to choose. Now, that may not be a consistently—I would not argue that's a consistently Christian tradition, but it is, it is a different position than where he is today, which is now he is more aggressive in saying we should expand abortion rights and we should protect abortion rights, and he's willing to run on kind of really— all access to abortion in a way he wasn't as a senator. And that's because his party, this left flank of his party has grown and he has to figure out how to run more to his left than he probably is naturally disposed to do. This is, a, this is, there's great tension in the democratic party about this. They, that you could even see this internal battle happening where in, in both parties where they, they know that a, a more centrist candidate would probably have broad appeal but their base is on the is on the edge, and and they're trying to figure out how to how to do both of those, which is really hard to do. Mm. I think a good way to summarize what you're 
saying, Hunter, about what is happening within both parties is that the more extreme factions of both parties are less committed to classic liberalism. We mentioned this model of classical conservatism, and that actually fits under this umbrella of classic liberalism. Mm -hmm. So those more extreme factions are putting pressure on the centrist elements of both parties. Is that a, is that a good summary? That That's a really good summary. And I think that leads to what we said is our third trend, which is classical liberalism, and we should define that here in just a minute, is being stressed. Mm -hmm. By classical liberalism, we mean that America was founded on a commitment to principles of liberty. You you see those in our Declaration of Independence. You see those in our Bill of Rights. These are these are principles of liberty that America was founded on. And we basically said this at our outset, we're not going to be a nation that is for a certain ethnic group of people only. We're not. So most nations, this is important to think about, most nations and then most nation states are for certain people groups. And there's they're always an amalgamation. A state is always an amalgamation probably of several people groups, but but they're kind of for people like us. And America was a, a political experiment in a lot of ways. And it said, we're gonna we're gonna define who is American based not so much on are you a certain ethnicity? Or have you come from a certain people group? Rather, we're going to define who is American based on do you subscribe to these principles of liberty and and are you committed to these principles of liberty and that are enshrined in our founding documents and our founding vision. The, the idea that we should be a nation governed by those is commonly called classical liberalism, and that classical liberalism would encompass both of what we call Republicans and Democrats. That is being stressed as we have, and I think it's being stressed for a couple of reasons. There's been this expanding and expanding and expanding definition of what those liberties should be. So think about, just for example, the debate that plays out about the Supreme Court. Should the Supreme Court's job be primarily to interpret and apply the original liberties in the Constitution, or should they be expanding those liberties by kind of taking a more expansive view of the Constitution? That's a that's a classic debate that's happening right now. And as they've taken the more expansive view, and as Americans as Americans understand of what is a a liberty, quote liberty, has grown, we we just it's been harder and harder and harder for us to agree as a nation on what are the principles of liberty that we are trying to do this political project on together. And so classical liberalism is stressed. And because it's stressed, some are saying like, this is not going to keep working anymore. Maybe we should think of something different. There's a short book by a historian that we've mentioned before, who you and I both enjoy reading, Hunter. Uh, her name is Jill Lepore. And the book is This America the case for the nation. And she makes this argument in support of classic liberalism in that little book. It reminded me when, when you were giving your definition that uh, she sums it up very well. It's, a, it's an accessible, short read. Yeah, it's like a 90-page argument mm -hmm. for uh, America being governed and, and based on principles of liberty. And She's making that argument in particular. If you read that little book, you'll see she's positioned her argument as opposed to what she sees as a rising threat of nationalism, particularly uh, as a vote by Trump. She nods a little bit, too. I don't think she she develops this enough. I wish she had developed this second thesis enough. She nods a little bit to the the left of America having this expansive view of rights or or not even – wanting to govern based on rights, but but wanting to based, govern based on principles of identity politics and, and power. And she, and she mentions that a little bit, but, but I think for her thesis to hold, she would need to expand that because I mm -hmm. think both of those, both nationalism and this, this more um, Marxist influence understanding of power dynamics as a, and 
as opposed to governing by principles of classical liberty. I think both those are stressing liberalism. So Mm -hmm. that's a long way of saying Jill Laporte's book is not a perfect book, Mm -hmm. but I think if you if you take it as a work of a historian who's saying this is how America was originally conceived and perceived, I, I think it's a pretty valuable guide to just understanding what classical liberalism is as opposed to some of the other forces that are at work in our in our current politics. Mm-hmm. In setting up her argument, she directly confronts the strain of thought that would say, because in many ways America has failed to live up to the ideals in its founding documents, to these expressed values, then this this project, this experiment of America isn't working. We need a different model, so burn it all down. She directly confronts that approach and instead argues for those ideals that were foundational to this classic liberal mindset and a way of governing. Hence the subtitle, The Case for the Nation. She's speaking as a historian, and she's actually critiquing her own field. She's saying there's not been good work done among historians in recent decades to make the case for the nation based on the principles of liberty. She says historians have become overly um, fascinated with and focused on little micro identities and giving little micro histories of different communities or people groups. And so there's feminist history and there's, and there's, um, you know, sexual history. And there's, there's these different sub kind of categories of history they're working out. And she's like, what's really needed is historians do the work of synthesis to make a case for America as a nation based on laws, the rule of law, and principles of, of liberty. And I find that to be pretty a pretty compelling argument, even if I wish she had explored some other dimensions <laughs> of it, not just the not just the Trump dimension, but but some other dimensions of it. Mm. So liberalism, this classic understanding of liberalism, the sort of liberalism Jill Lepore is arguing for and supporting and saying is still actually best (laughs) for our nation. Uh, That is what is being stressed. And I think that is partly due to the waning influence of Christianity in America as well. We discussed, I do recall this, Hunter, that in a previous episode, we discussed that the framers of those founding documents to which we refer often uh, may not have themselves been Christian in the sense of understanding the gospel in the way that we would talk about it. But they were influenced by an understanding of human value value and dignity that is clear in the way that they wrote and constructed those documents. And so there is a resonance between those and some foundational truths within a Christian worldview. So as the influence of Christianity in America has waned, that resonance has lessened. And and part of the effect that we're seeing is this stressing Mm -hmm. of classic liberalism, because those underlying values that are central to our Christian uh, worldview were expressed in these classic liberal documents. And so there's less informing still or that motivation to hold to those. Yeah, that book causes me to ask the question internally. If you take away the biblical worldview and if you take away the history of Christianity, and as we get further and further removed from that, is a liberal political project sustainable? It, it does force me to ask that question. And you can look at that and go, democracy and and principles of freedom, they don't just work anywhere. <laughs> we can think of, and, and we've made mistakes as a country in thinking we can just import democracy to people who don't have the philosophical and intellectual and historical commitments and religious commitments that, that Americans have historically had, and, and it doesn't work. <laughs> so, so think about what happened in Iraq, for example. We, we think, we, we just go, they'll, they'll embrace democracy. And without the commitment to virtue and to civility that really comes out of the Christian worldview, democracy doesn't work. Our, our founders noticed that. They, they knew that virtue is essential to a a liberal democracy working. So as I read that book, I kind of start to ask that question. I literally saw a fascinating video this week by Richard Dawkins, who is a noted atheist and and opponent of religion. And Richard Dawkins was being interviewed. And he he said, I would call myself a cultural Christian. (laughs) 
<laughs> and he said, I don't believe Christianity, but I appreciate Christianity's cultural influence and the the pres- preserving effect it has had on Western democracy and the worldview it's created. He, he might have even said something to the effect of, what I'm doing as an atheist assumes Christianity and, and requires a Christian uh, society or, a, or a, a society that's been influenced by, by Christianity. So it was a stunning and fascinating admission. And it says to us there has been a value in a kind of widespread cultural Christianity. The value is not that everyone's a born-again Christian, which born-again Christian is just there, there's only one kind of Christian biblically, which is a born again <laughs> person who is born again. That is how you become a according Christian. According to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. But but there not everyone in a culturally Christian society has received this gift of new birth that Jesus talked about. But there's still value. There's there's cultural preserving, political preserving value to this influence of Christianity. So <laughs> if that wanes, is liberal democracy sustainable? I think that's a fair question. <laughs> Uh, there's a writer, Jonathan Lehman, who you, you've mentioned before on the podcast, Hunter. I read an article he wrote in a church journal recently, and I think that his his thoughts here speak directly to what we're saying. This is sort of a paraphrase. I'm cutting out a part of it because it's not relevant. But he says, I'm not saying the Bible gives us classical liberalism, but I would say the Bible's view of government overlaps with classic liberalism at least at these two crucial points, both impose a narrow jurisdictional lane on the government and both charge the government with protecting the basic political equality of all citizens. Mm. And then if you ask the question, how do you define equality of all citizens? Mm -hmm. For, think of of our Declaration of Independence that we talked about on a previous episode, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Just the worldview that people are created by God and that's why they're equal is really important. And if you take away that agreement, well, we're all created by God. If you take away that agreement and you substitute in a, we all are the product of natural selection, then suddenly the why we're all equal doesn't make quite as much sense, does it? Mm-hmm. And And should government then preserve us equally doesn't make quite as much sense Mm -hmm. anymore. And that's the thing that we need to be thinking about as Christians, as the influence of Christianity and the worldview wanes in our society. Mm -hmm. It gives us that particular perspective of human value, and it gives us a framework for justice based in law that's not just a law created by man, but is a law created by Mm -hmm. a creator or a higher power. Okay, so three trends in American politics. That's right. One, all politics is national. (laughs) Two, (laughs) ideological tension exists within both parties. Three, liberalism is being stressed. And all of this makes us feel (laughs) unstable. (laughs) Unstable. So politics in America feels unstable. And now comes the time when you tell us what Christians do in light of this. Mm, I actually have a question. (laughs) <laughs> oh, 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 you asked me a question. Uh, my question is, if these three trends are true, we think they are, how can Christians thoughtfully engage in politics? Then? No, that's what that's in the question I was trends. asking you. I was hoping you were gonna <laughs> you were gonna speak to that. Um, a couple of things come to mind for me. One is not to overlook the importance of your local, politics, and and I don't just mean that in terms of your city council and your school board, although those are important, but I mean all political relationships and activities locally. We we often get angsty, like we've got to do something about these big problems, and, and we don't have the agency to do something about them by ourselves. But I do think there's a preserving effect to being engaged in local politics with our neighbors in our city. I know you, you actually, you give a lot of thought to that. So, so I actually do think you have something to, to, <laughs> to teach us here. Uh, um, well, I have, I have one thought and one example. I think because all politics is national, that we can spend a lot of time mulling over or worrying about a lot of big trends 
that, as we said, probably aren't as contentious or as relevant in our day-to-day lives in our communities as we may believe them to be. Not to say they're not important or not relevant, but within our local relationships. They don't have to hold the power impact Mm. that sometimes we might assume them to because of the way that the media presents them. So that's one thought. Uh, One example is that when you do this, you when you are involved in your local institutions, and maybe those are distinctly political institutions like a school board, but just your local institutions, you're engaging in local politics in a way that over time does give you the ability to influence those institutions. So here's the example. Uh, This week, a mom who I know here at Fellowship, whose kids have been in public schools in Denver for all of their schooling. One is in middle school, one's in high school right now. Um, Had an incident happen at their middle school that ran directly counter to what they would want to happen. There was a lack of transparency. There was a a way in which sex ed was taught to middle schoolers at her child's school that shouldn't have happened, wasn't age appropriate, and impacted her child directly. But she has spent time over many years being involved in that school and getting to know the school leadership. So when this happened, she was able to reach out directly, give voice to her concern, and then ask, is there a different entity that you could use to provide this? If it's required by the state, then perhaps a different organization could teach this material to the kids in a way that isn't (laughs) egregious as she saw it Mm -hmm. and is more age appropriate. And that's because she was involved in a local institution. So not Mm. only can she now advocate on behalf of her child, but is in a position to perhaps prevent this from happening again on Mm. behalf of all of these children who are in this particular school. So that's an, an example of local involvement that does give you the ability to influence um, in, in some small ways, in some significant ways, those institutions. What I'm picking up on there, too, is there are times when if you've done the hard work of developing relationships and and you've built that trust up over time, there are times when you need to strategically cash that in. Mm-hmm. I can think of a couple of different organizations that I've served on the board of and served faithfully in, inside those organizations and supported them for years. And there have been moments when I've had to have hard conversations with with people inside the organization that I felt were necessary to preserve the integrity or the mission of the organization. And I, I can remember running the calculation, like, is this the time when I actually want to cash in some credibility chips in order to raise this issue? And, and so I do want to encourage us we're not saying just be faithfully present and don't ever raise the hard Mm -hmm. conversation and and you don't have to be combative on all fronts if i had if i had always been a combative presence inside those organizations i would have had zero credibility to raise an issue because they i I would have just worn out my welcome so to speak there's there's a there's a wisdom uh, uh, required to be present faithfully and engaged and then to ask when does when does my Christian worldview and convictions require me to raise an important conversation? It sounds like that mom knew that, knew that mm-hmm. moment was there. <laughs> um, I think this is possible, too, through so many of our served under partnerships. They're not distinctly political organizations, but they are community lo- organizations that uh, give us connection points to uh, the people around us and to seeing things from other people's perspectives, as you were talking about, um, and being present in people's lives and in creating stable institutions in our communities that bring about common good and flourishing. And that's our our whole hope uh, in this discussion of politics. That's why we engage in politics. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's one answer. Mm. <laughs> Be involved <laughs> in local political entities. And... Uh, What would be a second way that Christians could thoughtfully engage in politics? Well, it's just to drill down one level on that and to say, be involved in a local church. 
And I'm coming back to an idea we discussed at the very beginning, which is that the local church is a political project, and the church is a political project. It is a people who live under the kingship of Jesus and who are governed by his word and the authority of his word, and they take that as their source of authority, and then they they work out their life together in order to both love each other and to fulfill the Great Commission. That's a that's a wonderful political project. And Jesus' teaching and the Bible should govern our beliefs. It should also govern our relationships. How do we relate to each other when there's conflict? What do, what do we do when when there is um, there, there's hard things that we have to confront? And we go back to our common source of authority, scriptures. And when we do that, we we have a blue, we have a political project blueprint. And the reason I think that's important to raise is the we are not promised political stability in our nation or even in our city, but we are promised that if the, a church that is shaped by the Word of God and, and all the people of the church, the, both the leaders and the members of the church, they, they agree to live under the authority of the Word of God and to relate to each other according to the authority of the Word of God and believe according to the authority of the Word of God and teach according to the authority of the Word of God and, and, and solve their conflicts according to the authority of the Word of God. That, that has a that is guaranteed to have uh, God's favor on it, mm-hmm. and and it does have a stability, and it and it does have not just a stability but a health that we that we don't necessarily find in the broader political sphere. I'm thinking here of Augustine's classic book, The City of God, and about once every month, I think I need to go reread that because it's been it's been a couple of decades, <laughs> but. But based on what I remember from from reading it 20 years ago, Augustine was writing at a time when the two things were true of the Roman Empire. Number one, the church had become closely wedded to the empire, so it was the, the Christianity was the official religion of the empire, and the empire was unstable. In fact, it only lasted about 50 more years after he wrote that that book. It it, it felt very fragile, and and he. One of his big theses in that book is this. The city of man and the city of God are growing right alongside each other right now, but one is eternal and one's not. (laughs) And one is stable because it's built on God's Word, and it's guaranteed that it will not fail because Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the other is not stable because it's built on it's built on the authority of man and the ideas of man, and and it's it's got so much idolatry inside it. So therefore, the you know two implications were number one, Christians shouldn't freak out when when the when the city of man is collapsing. So part of his message in that was, hey, church, the empire is maybe collapsing. Let's not freak out. This doesn't mean that the mission of God is over. It doesn't mean that the church of God is collapsing, and it does even in this part of the world, it doesn't mean the church of God is is collapsing, so let's not freak out. And then his message to the empire was, don't blame the Christians for this, <laughs> because, because you need to look to your own idolatry for the instability. And and there was a lot of wanting to blame the, the Christians for the, the problems. And, and so he was writing as an apologetic to say, this is this is this is uh this is your own doing because of because of idolatry and it was a call to repentance for society so very nuanced um multifaceted argument he made there but he made it during a time of political stability and as i reflect on that i think that reminds me that investing in a local church leading a local church helping people inside the local church to be involved in this wonderful political project, which should be just a small, imperfect foretaste of the kingdom of God, is a wonderful thing to give myself to. And it's a wonderful thing for all of us to give ourselves to. In our first episode, we mentioned that the church is a redeemed politic. And in the passage you mentioned a moment ago, when Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he is giving us this sense that the church is the political entity that will carry out his will. So through loving each other in the way that he teaches us to, through serving each other in our local communities in a way that is aligned with the ethos of Jesus' kingdom, 
And by adhering to sound, faithful, biblical teaching in that way, the church demonstrates this redeemed politic to those around us. So it might not seem intuitive, but involvement in a local church is a way to uh, be involved in your local political sphere. Amen. Hit the drums, Jesse. <laughs> All right. Bum, 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 bum. Well, we're going to be back for one more discussion on politics. That's a Q&R episode. So if you have a question that's been kicking around in your mind about politics, or if you have a suggestion about what you'd like to hear us discuss on the podcast in the future, send all of that anytime to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Special thanks to Adam England for our theme music, to Jesse Cowan, our producer, and to Judd Connell, who provides transcription for these episodes.